Hello. My name is Bob Moore. I'm the president of Gensim Corporation. Today I would like to introduce our company to you and our products. Gensim is a software company. We do not uh, deal in hardware. We're strictly a software company. And our main product is the G2 development and deployment environment. G2 brings together a number of technologies. And these technologies brought together in an integrated package allow uh, engineers and other professionals to develop their applications and put them online much more productively than if they have to do individual programming. The center of G2 is the G2 real-time expert system. Uh, this technology was developed by Gensim and allows a very strong knowledge-based reasoning capability to be implemented as part of an application. This can involve rule-based reasoning, but also procedures and models can be used. So it's a very rich rule-based uh, and procedure and model-based environment. In addition to the technology of the knowledge-based system uh, put into real time, G2 also brings together technology for interfacing with high performance to external databases and systems. For example, we have interfaces to Oracle, Sybase, RDB, and other common databases. Uh, we have interfaces to the common systems used in the process industry, manufacturing, telecommunications, and other uh, areas of application. G2 also brings together a technology we call G2 Network, which allows multiple applications to communicate to each other so that G2 can be distributed in cooperative online uh, reasoning for many parts of an organization and these can be in communication and cooperation with each other. Also, G2 is completely object oriented. Uh, this includes the knowledge representation and other aspects and also includes the graphics. You'll see in the applications of G2 that the object oriented graphics allow much of the definition of the application to be done graphically at a very high level. Also, G2 has a capability which is an application layer on top of X windows or deck windows which is uh, allowing multiple users to share an application. This is called telewindows. And with telewindows, uh, multiple persons can have their own level of access to an application, yet they can be simultaneously sharing that application. This is used for joint development and cooperation, or it is used for deployment where multiple persons will be accessing the application online. We also integrated into G2 a dynamic simulator. Uh, we did this initially so that the applications could be tested as they're developed because many of these applications are going online in process or factory or other applications where you wish to determine the correctness of the application without having to wait for particular conditions that you hope may never occur in some cases. Uh, the simulation allows this to be done, allows an application to be tested as it is built. But it also has been found to be useful uh, in additional areas. For example, you can prototype an application in G2, and with the simulator, you can test it and show how it behaves under various scenarios. And the experts in the application can critique it as it's being developed and defined and prototyped. And this allows a knowledge capture capability so that the simulator in combination with G2 and the graphics of G2 allows uh, the capture of expert knowledge. Also, the simulator is useful for later training or demonstration of the application. And all of the application in G2 is done in structured natural language and graphics. There are over a thousand online installations of G2, and these have all been done at this high level, which you'll see in the demonstration. So G2 is a development and deployment environment which has over a thousand installations and which our customers tell us is about 20 times more productive than programming in terms of getting an application online. In addition to our product G2, Gensum offers customer support. We have training courses that we offer almost on a weekly basis. We offer them in many uh, offices around the world. Uh, we have a maintenance program to help our customers uh, with their installations as well as to answer questions and if there are any bugs to fix them. 
Uh, we have updates, and as we develop new features of G2, we provide these to our customers as part of our maintenance program so that each customer maintains a high level of technology continually on the front of uh, technology development. Also, we have a user group, a very strong user group, which meets every year in Europe, in the United States, and in uh, Asia. And uh, these user group meetings allow the leaders in online applications uh, to share their experiences and to advise us also on how G2 should evolve. And we take this into account as a major input into our evolutionary process of improvements in G2, and then these improvements are made available as updates to the customer base. We also offer assistance in applications and in data uh, uh, face engineering to uh, uh, the various uh, uh, systems and databases that uh, G2 interfaces to. Gensum has grown rapidly. We founded the company in 1986. Uh, we introduced G2 in its first release in 1988. We've had two additional releases in 1990 and now in 1992. Uh, we've been growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, last year in 1991, we grew 30%, which we did in the midst of a worldwide recession. Our business so far in 1992 is up over 40% uh, from the year earlier. And we've been operating profitably for 16 quarters in a row ever since the introduction of G2. We have offices now uh, in, in uh, North America, in Europe, and in Asia. In North America, our, our head office, of course, is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we have offices also in Toronto, Chicago, Washington, Atlanta, Houston, and two in California. And we've just opened new offices in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So we have 10 offices altogether in North America as of the time of this presentation. And uh, our business is about 60% North America, about 25% in Europe, and about 12% in Japan. So we're a worldwide company. In other areas of the world, we have offices uh, across Europe, uh, in, in Munich, in Paris, London, in Norway, Sweden, and a new office that we're just opening now in the Netherlands. So six offices in Europe, and we have a new office that we have opened uh, in Korea as well. We have also these red squares are the uh, support partners around the world who offer training and installation support in addition to uh, reselling G2. We have a total of 85 uh, partners in 23 countries around the world. So G2 is uh, sold and supported on a worldwide basis. We work with most of the large companies in the industrial world. Uh, almost all of the top 25 industrial corporations in the world are using G2. 22 of the 25 largest industrial companies as of the time of this presentation are using G2. Uh, in the petroleum area, eight of the 10 largest petroleum companies use G2. And major customers include uh, uh, Exxon and uh, Texaco and others. Uh, also in the chemical area, nine of the 10 largest chemical companies use G2. Uh, DuPont, for example, has guideline G2 as their one and only recommended uh, product for their plants to use for uh, online uh, expert system applications. Monsanto, 3M, and others have also uh, chosen G2 as their product for online applications. Uh, Lafarge Cement uh, proceeded with an order for 25 cement plants uh, using G2. So uh, there are many volume users now in the process industries. As an example of one of these, we'll take the first installation at Monsanto, which has been published. And this information is from published documents. The first quotation is from Control Engineering in July of 1989. Um, this is when Monsanto first uh, was putting online their first G2 application at the Cromerick plant in Illinois. And, uh, they were implementing a system with 150 rules uh, looking at 5,000 objects. Now, the reason they're able to do this is because of the object-oriented uh, representation of knowledge in G2, that you could have one rule, for example, looking for a certain kind of problem uh, and looking at all sensors. So you can use what we call generic rules with one expression 
of a rule look at a whole class of objects and find if any of them has a problem. Uh, this kind of use of uh, the object-oriented representation makes G2 very, very powerful. Uh, they put this installation online in uh, the fall of 1989. Uh, it was put online to assist the operators, uh, not to replace them, but to assist them and to detect problems that were not detectable by other means. Uh, I really like the phrase they used in their paper, an extra pair of eyes. This is a good way to think of G2 in the typical process diagnostic application, uh, detecting problems that would be missed otherwise. Uh, the installation at Monsanto included two workstations, one for the operator and one for the engineer. And they used the product TeleWindows, which is part of our product line, so that both the engineer and the operator could be sharing the online application. Now, the operator had a very simple interface so that he wouldn't change, for instance, rules or models. The engineer, on the other hand, could go into the models and rules and make changes so that each of them could be sharing the same application but with their own level of access. Now this system was uh, interfaced to a Fisher uh, controls, uh, process control system uh, and through an interface which in fact Fisher offers on their price list. This is a photograph of the installation. There's G2 running its diagnostic application right in the control room uh, with the distributed control system of the plant. Now, this is what uh, Monsanto published uh, about nine months later. This is from the Chemical Manufacturers Association meeting in March of 1990. And they pointed out that they'd gone online in September of 1989 and that they'd been running continuously with only power failures of the electricity to the computer uh, being the only times uh, when the system was not running. Uh, it's also helpful to point out that Monsanto purchased G2 for three additional plants uh, in between the first and second of these uh, uh, statements that they've made. So they obviously uh, saw a very good return uh, from this installation. And in fact, Monsanto is one of the companies that has chosen G2 as their standard uh, for online expert systems. Manufacturing is another area of use of G2. Uh, we work with uh, many of the uh, companies who are uh, doing advanced manufacturing such as Boeing and Caterpillar and others. Some of the published applications, IBM has published uh, their application in Toronto where they're making the most complex circuit board that IBM manufactures. It's the disk controller for their mainframe. And it's a complex manufacturing task. G2 has a strong role in helping to track and schedule and uh, and diagnose uh, the, uh, the manufacturing of the circuit board. Another application which has been published is the Nissan plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. This is the largest automotive plant under one roof in the United States. And this plant uh, was looking for software and uh, applications help in uh, optimizing the control of the workflow of automobiles in the production uh, of the plant. They, in this case, selected Digital Equipment Corporation as the prime contractor, and Digital chose G2 for the application software. That system's online, and it's helping to optimize the movement of automobiles through the production facility to optimize the use of the labor and uh, to expedite uh, selected uh, units through the plant. Uh, another application that's uh, quite interesting is VLSI technology. Uh, in their new uh, semiconductor fabrication facility in San Antonio, Texas. They're implementing a system with uh, G2 interface to fast tech uh, cell controllers. And uh, this is a total paperless uh, manufacturing control system for the semiconductor industry. Uh, another important application for manufacturing is dynamic scheduling. Uh, dynamic scheduling is tying together the MRP or uh, information system side of a company with the shop floor uh, uh, production control side of a company. This is a new area of application for G2 in the last uh, few years and a very important one. Uh, in dynamic scheduling, the main objectives are first to do predictive scheduling, to schedule the plant in such a way as to optimize the use of resources and to meet the 
needs of the customer, to do reactive scheduling, which means if a resource is taken out of operation or is planned to be taken out of operation, a rescheduling can be done around that uh, change in resource. Also, if a new order comes in, so for instance, a make-to-order situation or an emergency order, uh, that order can be put into the uh, production and dynamically things can be rescheduled in order to optimize uh, the production again. So it can react to uh, resource changes or uh, objectives changes. And finally, because it's all built on G2, uh, you can monitor the production that actually occurs and compare it automatically to the schedule. So the G2 can actually monitor the achievement of the schedule. Uh, now, these uh, next few slides are actual uh, screenshots from the screen. So you get to see a little bit of the flavor of G2 in this particular application. Uh, this application is a rolling mill. This is online now at uh, Carpenter Technology, which is one of the largest specialty steel manufacturers in the United States. And there's a rolling mill in the plant, which is the bottleneck. And this rolling mill is served by a conveyor, which is uh, uh, taking material from furnaces and taking it through the rolling mill. The furnaces can go through different processes or different temperature programs to maintain the correct metallurgical properties of the steel prior to it being rolled. Uh, now, each individual customer order may have a certain thickness of uh, the rolled steel and also certain metallurgical properties that need to be achieved. So there has to be not only a thickness to the product, but also it may have to go through a certain process first. Uh, these are the orders that have been brought over from the MRP system on the, uh, on the uh, mainframe computer. These orders are sorted by the uh, thickness of the rolled product. So there's a sort of a way to visualize the orders and the different uh, rolling requirements. And then as these orders are scheduled, they're colored so that you can see which orders have been scheduled. And we're in the middle of the scheduling process here. Each item on the schedule represents a certain process unit. The rolling mill and each furnace is represented. And then this is 24 hours representing the time of the scheduling of each of these units. During each time of uh, the unit being in use, there may be multiple orders in that unit being heated through the temperature program and then they'll be rolled in the rolling mill. So right now it's doing the predictive scheduling, scheduling forward in time, uh, and it's using uh, something called constraint-based reasoning, which is a way to deal with very complex problems. It's the modern way to do scheduling. It's been recognized as the technology uh, of the future, and it's here now with G2. Uh, and here we've achieved the schedule, and we're now uh, making a change in it. What we've done is we've selected one of these furnaces, in this case the G furnace, and we've selected that furnace and we've said we're going to take it out of production for a while. We're going to say that it's not going to be available, so that the schedule is now going to be partly invalid. And one of the problems in a real plant is if you make a change like this, uh, it can be very complex to understand how it interacts with other changes or what you should do now. And typically, in real time, you just can't do it in a, in a real plant and maintain an optimal schedule. But with the dynamic scheduling package, which we offer on top of G2, which you're seeing here, we can do that. We enter in a reservation on the G furnace. And here that reservation is shown in yellow. It's probably not too visible from... Uh, the video, but uh, in this uh, place where I'm showing with the pointer uh, is a yellow bar reserving the G furnace for that period of time on the schedule. And now it's given a message that the schedule is no longer valid and it's retracted all of the dependent decisions. Now just to illustrate that point, notice that here is a decision, for example, for the E furnace at a later point in the day, and that decision stays. It didn't retract that one. So it's not retracting everything that happens later in time. It's just retracting the dependent decisions. I made a change in the resources. What's dependent on that? Retract those changes. And so that's what it's done. And now it needs to reschedule. And you ask it to reschedule. It's now rescheduling, as you can see, coloring in the orders as it reschedules them. Now as it's rescheduling, it's also taking account of what it learned the first time through. So it has a learning algorithm to learn about uh, the, uh, the uh, best scheduling choices. Uh, this package is now online. 
Uh, at Carpenter Technology, customers very happy with it. Uh, this product is uh, being uh, released uh, this year, 1992, and uh, is the first uh, dynamic scheduling product using this new constraint-based reasoning technology that's available on the market. In aerospace and defense, we work with most of the large uh, uh, aerospace uh, companies in, uh, in the United States. Uh, some of the ones in particular, uh, General Electric, for example, chose G2 for uh, a, a VAC station cluster of 52 VACs, which is uh, controlling telemetry ground station for the next generation of uh, satellites that will be monitoring uh, the space missions. Uh, NASA uses G2 quite extensively. Uh, there are 20 copies of G2 at Johnson Space Center as of this uh, uh, lecture, and we're very proud that in the recent mission to rescue the satellite, where the astronauts went out and actually grabbed the satellite, uh, Jensen was part of that mission. There were, at that time and that mission, there were five G2s running at Johnson Space Center in support of the mission. Two were online to live data uh, with uh, displays in the uh, flight control room. And three were in the back rooms uh, giving advice uh, to the support engineers. And also at Intelsat in Washington, D.C., there was a G2 live online to all of the ground stations around the world. And Intelsat even participated in a press release on that application, which was the first time they'd done such a press release uh, because they were so pleased. Uh, G2 was able to detect one of the uh, ground stations having a problem 12 hours before the launch. And they were able to fix that in time for the launch and the, and the satellite rescue mission. Uh, this is a screenshot, an actual screenshot of a uh, NASA application. Uh, if you can kind of in your mind imagine a space shuttle here. This is a space shuttle and these uh, little green arrows are reaction jets which the astronaut controls to move the shuttle's attitude uh, while it's in orbit, maneuvering, trying to catch satellites and so on. And uh, one of the problems is you can see there are a lot of jets. Uh, if some of them fail, uh, it's not immediately intuitively obvious which modes of control you've lost, if any. And so the purpose of this particular application was to allow the flight controllers and the astronauts to know which uh, control modes they could still have under various conditions of multiple jet failures. And uh, they can uh, also use this in simulation for training uh, so they can fail different jets and they can uh, see which uh, modes they lose in terms of controllability. This is one of the uh, published successes of NASA uh, using G2. Uh, we work with the food and beverage and the pulp and paper industries. Uh, there are a number of uh, food companies. Uh, one that's published in particular, Mrs. Baird's Bakery, uh, chose G2 for a complete uh, manufacturing uh, planning and execution system, uh, the complete supply chain uh, application uh, for uh, the largest independent uh, bakery in the United States. Uh, also uh, in the paper industry, ABB has published about their application for paper quality. I'm going to be speaking about that in a few moments. Uh, this is the application for paper quality. Uh, it's called EPAC is the uh, name for the application. That is, it's a layered application on top of G2. And uh, it was first installed at the Norske Skog, which is the largest paper mill in Norway. And uh, there are a number of problems that they're trying to achieve, but the main point is that they have quality as their focus. It's a quality control application. Uh, in the paper application, they have raw materials, which may have variation. Uh, they make paper. This goes to testing in a lab. And the lab tests then come back uh, to the database Quality specifications can also change as different customer orders are being made. Uh, paper test technician communicates with the machine operator, and the machine operator makes changes uh, in the machine. Now, the uh, reason that this is complex and uh, requires some technology like G2 is that, that this is not just a single uh, control chart, single adjustment type of quality problem. In fact, they identified a number of different controls that they could make. They could change dyes, they could change the, the raw material mixtures, could change various control adjustments on the machine. Each of these controls affected multiple tests, quality tests they're trying to achieve. So it's interactive, it's multivariable, 
It has dynamic delays. You can see why quality, in fact, is a complex problem in a real plant. It, it is something that the experienced operators may uh, need uh, 10 or 20 years to really understand. And the new operators don't have a chance. What they did with G2 is they represented this matrix of quality, the various control adjustments, the various tests, the interactions were represented by the uh, connections on the matrix, and then the extent of the interactions was determined by interviewing the expert operators. So uh, this was an interview process, a capture of knowledge process. But once this model had been put together, it was put online, and it was put online as a what if capability. Now this illustrates another difference between the decision support applications of G2 and uh, perhaps more conventional systems. Uh, with G2, you can do such things as what if. You could even have multiple choices. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do the other thing? See how each one of them uh, produces a result and then make your choice. Uh, this is one example, and I think in this uh, complex quality application will become quite important. Uh, the application is being installed now in, uh, in a second uh, paper mill in uh, Scandinavia, and it's a product from ABB. Telecommunications, a uh, relatively newer market for us, but we're getting some significant applications. Uh, SWIFT is a society uh, for the worldwide uh, uh, transfer of money funds around the world, and they have uh, done a major rollout in Europe uh, using G2. Uh, they've published about this application. It's a uh, diagnostic monitoring of the network application. Uh, Telefonica, MCI, and others are major uh, customers uh, in this area. Metals and utilities. I mentioned briefly carpenter technology in the, in the steel making area. There are other major steel companies and aluminum companies using G2. Uh, in the electric power area, there are a number of installations. And uh, in particular, in Sweden, they're using G2 for uh, uh, emergency support for operators. We'll speak of that in a few moments. In Japan, there's a project to tie together all of the nuclear plants in Japan into Tokyo for a nationwide emergency response system, all using G2. And the Japanese partners on that are Mitsubishi, uh, Hitachi, and Toshiba. And uh, this project is uh, scheduled by 1996 to be a nationwide diagnostic system. Uh, the nuclear site, uh, the first nuclear site in Sweden is Forsmark. It's a very advanced uh, nuclear plant uh, and is one of six nuclear plants in Sweden. Uh, they uh, uh, make about 20 percent of the Swedish nuclear power. They're putting online a G2 for critical safety functions. And the project started in 1988. Uh, so it's been going through quite a uh, evolution and building period. Uh, it involves some custom graphics, which are essentially live versions of the training manual that uh, uh, the operator uses when he learns how to run the nuclear plant with 130 di diagrams from the training manual, but now live with color changes and graphic changes. And then there's a G2 embedded with 2,000 rules on safety monitoring. Uh, there, uh, they have the 2,000 rules and 130 process diagrams that they have been validating with real operators using uh, data from their simulator, which they use to train the operators also. Uh, deployment has also begun now on a second site, also in Sweden. So two of the six nuclear plants in Sweden are moving forward uh, using G2 to help the operators uh, diagnose uh, emergency situations. Altogether, there are many industries that use G2. We've mentioned a few of them. We've focused on uh, chemical and uh, electric utility and a few others. But there are quite a few, and uh, G2 is used uh, in many applications. The one uh, unifying aspect of these applications is G2 is typically used for online applications. That is, 90% of the G2 licenses that we sell are online G2 licenses. And that typically are larger applications because G2 is designed to handle large applications in real time. Uh, this is a, uh, a screenshot from one of the uh, larger applications as an example. This is uh, a screenshot uh, showing uh, what the um, operators of a, a biosphere 
in Arizona see when they look uh, at their screens. They can pick up uh, workspaces with different areas. Uh, they can examine different problems. We'll show you how the workspaces are formed in G2 in the demonstration shortly. The platforms that G2 is offered on, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, the VAX and the DEC station, and soon the Alpha uh, line from digital, Hewlett Packard, the 9000 product line, IBM, the RS6000, and the PS2 uh, uh, will be later this year released, Sun Microsystems, the Sun and Sparks uh, versions, and also uh, there are a number of PCs uh, that G2 is offered on, including uh, later this year will be on the uh, Windows environment uh, of the uh, 386, 486. The applications that are done in G2 are portable across platforms. Uh, so it's very common for uh, engineers or others who are developing G2 applications to develop on one platform and run on another. Or if you're running on one platform and you want to upgrade to a newer platform, that's quite easy as well. Uh, also for system integrators or others who are providing layered solutions on top of G2, the fact that they can be offered with a customer choosing the platform is very convenient. Uh, G2 is also used as, as a uh, front end for integrating together multiple sources of information as G2 can run in real time on one of the host platforms and the data server capabilities of G2 can be getting data from user programs or databases or control systems, uh, program logic controllers, uh, external uh, simulations or other such programs. And uh, with respect to G2, it doesn't interrupt the reasoning process while the data is being acquired. This can be a request response or it can be unsolicited information. It can be vectors of information. It can be ASCII strings. Uh, so G2 has a very complete and robust capability to handle the data interfacing. And this uh, product we call GSI for G2 Standard Interface takes care of the issues of protocol and buffering and handshaking and restoring after break, and the other important issues for a robust data interface. So G2 is often uh, getting information in real time online from multiple data sources around the organization. And we also have a gateway design with G2 so there can be even more than one G2 accessing multiple sources of data in a gateway design. We have a client server design with G2 such that multiple persons can be sharing an application. This is using the TeleWindows product which we mentioned a bit earlier. These multiple users can be developers who are jointly developing or they can be multiple users around an organization. In each case, they have an individual level of access and an individual look and feel uh, at their authorized level of, uh, of uh, interaction with the system. In, a, for instance, a typical plant configuration, there may be uh, operators getting decision support advice based on a real-time analysis of the uh, operation of the plant, but there also may be engineers, maintenance people, plant operations people, plant management, many persons around the organization who wish to have access to the live data coming through a knowledge base serving their interests. And this is a whole layer of knowledge based application which does not yet exist in most of the plants of the world and it represents an entire market which is now possible because of G2 and TeleWindows. As a summary of G2, it's a highly productive development environment. Uh, it's object oriented. It has direct capture of expert knowledge and structured natural language and graphics. And this knowledge can be interactively developed and tested. So you can work together with your end users to refine the prototype, to make sure it's functioning to the satisfaction of the end user. And then when you're finished, that model that you've developed, in fact, can go on to a runtime G2 and be the application. So code generation is not required. It's about 20 times faster to develop an application this way compared to conventional programming. Uh, G2 is real time. It operates with thousands of rules and procedures per second, uh, with very high performance interfaces to external data. 
a very important aspect of G2. And strategically, there's some significant advantages in, the, in addition to these. Knowledge in object form and graphic and structured language, uh, natural language, is much more reusable. Uh, knowledge can be deployed around your organization, reused by others. It can be authorized and there can be access restrictions, but you can redeploy and reuse knowledge. You can capture the knowledge of your experts before they retire or they move, and you can keep that as a resource, redeploy it, reuse it, and build upon it to uh, have uh, the next generation of libraries, libraries beyond books, libraries of live knowledge, which are now possible because of G2. Thank you very much. We're going to show you a demonstration now. Hello, my name is Bob Moore. I'm the president of Gensim Corporation. And today we're going to do a demonstration of our product G2, which is a development and deployment environment for real-time online applications. I'm going to do the, this demonstration as if we're starting from a blank slate. This is to show, in particular, the structured natural language and graphics building capability uh, of G2 and also the object-oriented uh, representation of G2. So with that brief introduction, I'd now like to give a demonstration. Okay. We're going to start from uh, having a blank slate. There's nothing yet in this knowledge base or this application. The first thing we do is to create a new workspace. and. Uh, on this uh, workspace, we're going to give it a name, and I will give this a name, uh, say, W1, for example. And I'm going to uh, give it a background color because I like to do that just so we can uh, color code uh, the work that we do. And so this is one workspace. I could create another one, for example. I'll say another new workspace and give this a name. I'm going to call this one, say, W2. And uh, also give this one a nice uh, background color and so on. Now, the concept is in G2, you organize the knowledge in workspaces. So here we have two workspaces. We could have as many as we wish. These workspaces have various things we can do with them, including hide them, for example. And we again have a, a, what looks like a blank slate, but now there's underlying some structure, I can say get workspace, and it has W1 and W2 as the workspaces. Uh, workspaces are like uh, wings of a library, and so you can organize your knowledge in these workspaces. And I'll choose one, for example, to, uh, to work on at the moment. Now, uh, what might we put into a workspace to define the application? Well, one thing we might say is let's do a new definition, and uh, let's do an object definition. And represent an object by a triangle here. And an object has a table or a structure to it. So G2 has a certain amount of built-in structure. Uh, for example, in the first, uh, uh, what we call attribute uh, of this uh, frame, it says notes incomplete. Now notes are where uh, G2 tells you uh, any problems in your object or your other uh, frame within G2. And here, incomplete because the object's not yet a, a complete object. Uh, there are other user restrictions, for example, because everything in G2 can be restricted in its access. Uh, class name, uh, well, we might give this a class name, for example. Let me call this, uh, for example, a, uh, a dryer, uh, just as an example. And superior class, uh, I might say choose existing class, and I'll choose an object as an example. So that uh, I have now defined a certain structure. Now, attributes specific to the class. Here's where we start to tell G2 about uh, attributes that are in this uh, class. And uh, I can give these attributes any name. For example, I may say pressure as one attribute. Uh, I may say, for instance, uh, um, airflow 
has another attribute, and so on. Uh, now, G2 doesn't know anything about these attributes yet, but it knows they are attributes of a dryer. Uh, there are other uh, uh, attribute slots here and entries as well. I won't get into all of them, but I will uh, go down to Icon Description and say Edit Icon. And uh, what I want to do is to draw this uh, process unit. I'll uh, use the Icon Editor to do that. I'll pick a shape, for example, a square, and I'll, I'll make a certain uh, shape as part of that icon. And I can give it a color, um, for example. And uh, icons can have multiple regions to them. And I can have multiple colors in the multiple regions. So I might, for instance, make the second region blue. And I might call the second region, for instance, the top. And I might give it a certain uh, shape. Perhaps I'll draw that circle. And now I've, I have a multi-layered icon. Now you can have as many layers as you want, and you can control the uh, colors of each layer so that you can have objects that are very live to the, uh, to the uh, eye. Now also I'm going to, uh, where it says stubs, I'm going to edit here, and I'm going to say this has an input and uh, an input, and I'm going to name a kind of an input. And uh, I'm going to call this, for instance, a, a flow pipe. Now, G2 doesn't yet in this application know what a flow pipe is, but uh, we'll see what happens when you define something in a uh, part of G2 that's not yet uh, been defined uh, elsewhere. And I'm going to say an input flow pipe located at the uh, left, and I'll give it a, a coordinate uh, uh, local coordinate of 40 here, and I'm going to say an uh, output uh, flow pipe. Now notice as I type things that uh, they appear in this structured natural language editor, and it gives a look ahead feature uh, for, th for things that uh, are already uh, possible according to uh, G2. And I'll say this one's located at the right, and I'll give it a coordinate system as well. So now I have defined some connections. And now look at the notes for this dryer. It says notes, OK, and note that the class flow pipe is not defined. So G2 tells you about the loose ends. Uh, this is a real benefit compared to, say, programming. Uh, as you're defining objects and so on, uh, it tells you about the loose ends. Now I can do a, a definition. And here I'll do a connection definition. and let me do, look at the frame of the connection definition and class. And let me define flow pipe. OK, so I've defined flow pipe. And I'll have a superior class for flow pipe. Choose existing class. I'll say it's a connection. Now I've defined what a flow pipe uh, is. It's a kind of a connection. And I'm going to give it a cross-sectional pattern. And up here again, the structured natural language editor is showing uh, the possible choices. And I'll say uh, three, uh, any color. I'll pick, say, black. And uh, I'll have uh, also an outline of two, any color, uh, let's say, uh, brown, just to illustrate this. Now, let's look at a dryer, create an instance. There's a dryer. You'll notice that there's the icon that we created with the uh, uh, two layers. And here are the connections that we created. And if I look at these connections, the connection, for instance, is a flow pipe. And it has a table. We didn't give it any attributes, but it has a table associated with it. This object is a dryer. And notice it has pressure and airflow as attributes. So uh, it knows that that's a dryer that has certain attributes. It doesn't know anything more about them at the present time. Uh, I might give this dryer a name. Let's call this dryer D1, for example. Uh, I might, for example, uh, uh, give this pressure attribute some more structure. Let's say uh, add an optional subtable, uh, make it a G2 variable, make it a quantitative variable. And here we have done something which is really quite powerful. And let me take a moment to explain it. This is the frame associated with D1, a dryer. 
This is the pressure attribute of that dryer. And I've taken that pressure attribute and I've expanded that into a complete frame, which is a quantitative variable, the pressure of D1. So this is the particular pressure of D1, and here's a frame describing it. Uh, I won't go into all the descriptions of things that are, are there, but let me, for example, point to this history keeping specification. I could say, for example, I want to keep history with maximum age of data points. Notice how I just select from the menu here of two hours, for example. And uh, now I have told G2 to keep a history of that data. I might say, for example, a data server. Where do I go to get the data? Uh, I can say, let's go get the data from a G2 simulator. Now, I do this for building and testing the expert system, and when I'm finished, uh, I can change that to get data from, say, a database or from a live system. Uh, validity interval. Uh, this is how long will I believe some conclusions based on this data. Um, and since uh, things may change, I'll say I'll only believe something for two seconds based on this data. Uh, so I put a lot of structure uh, behind this variable, the pressure. It says no simulation for me yet. I, I told it to get the data from a simulator, but I haven't told it how to simulate it yet. Now let's look at uh, how we might uh, display uh, information. Let's pick a readout table, for example, and let's say I want to read out uh, that I'll show simulated values. I'll change that to yes. I want to show the simulated values uh, every one second. And notice it knows good grammar too. It changed that to one second where it was plural before. And expression to display. I'm going to display the... I'm going to type P and now it's restricted the choices to the things that start with P. I'm going to say R. Now it's restricted to things that start with PR, and so on. Or I could select pressure, and it finishes the phrase. So G2 gives you this look ahead of, uh, of things that are possible. And now I type D, and it knows these are the things that start with D that it could refer to. I'll say D1. And that's all I have to do. Now, uh, if you have a large application, you may want to take advantage of some of the more powerful capabilities of G2. For instance, I might want to say uh, operate on area here, and let me now put a box around a whole set of objects. In this case, just two objects, the dryer and this display object, but it could be many objects. And you could say clone, and you might say clone again, and you might say quit. I now have three objects where I just had one before. Uh, let me name the second one uh, D2, for example, and let me name this uh, third one uh, D3 as an example. And let me say here I want to look at the pressure of D2, and here I'll say I want to look at the pressure of D3. So now I've got uh, basically three objects, uh, and they all have this uh, uh, structure of the first object. Now, I'm going to now give some simulation uh, definition to this pressure to show some of the generic capabilities. I'll do a new definition, and I'll say, uh, let's do a generic simulation formula. And I'll say um, the uh, pressure. any dryer is equal to the pressure of the, and I, I'll just say object to be at the high level, object connected at the input to the dryer, and let me say uh, minus 3, give it a little offset just so it'll make it interesting. And this is a generic simulation formula. And now if I look at any of these objects, like I'll pick D1, and I look at the table, and the pressure of D1, and I look at the subtable, I now have 
simulation details dependent. Every one of these pressures depends on the simulation that I defined. Now I can I can modify that. For instance, for this first D1, I'm going to override that with a specific simulation just to show uh, interesting uh, behavior. I'll say simulation formula for D1, make that a state variable, DDT equals 0.5 with initial value of 0. Now what I've done there is just put a little ramp function in for the first one. And uh, now let me connect the first one to the second one. Now let me connect the second one to the third one. And now let me start this application. And what you're going to see now is that, first of all, it's ramping the first pressure according to the specific model that I put in. And it's feeding that pressure into the second object using this generic simulation formula and feeding that into the third object using that generic uh, simulation formula. So G2 can pass values between objects. It can run dynamic models. Uh, and it can operate at the object level. Uh, I could, for instance, pause this for a moment. Let me uh, clone an object and uh, let me call this new object, for example, uh, D4. And let me uh, clone a uh, display. And let me say I want to look at D4 in this display. And let me connect these objects together. And let me resume. And now we've got live one more object simulating and displaying. So you can see that you can uh, expand the domain or expand the application very rapidly. Now let me add a rule to this. Let's add a new rule. Let's say if the pressure of any dryer, say is greater than 50, then now there's a lot of things you can do. You can change things, move them around, conclude things, and so on. I'm going to say inform the operator for the next 8 seconds that, and you can give some quoted message. I'm going to say the uh, pressure of, here I'll put in the name of D, okay? And what is D? D is any dryer. I'll just give it that local name, D, is, I'll put in the value of P. And what's P? I'll give any pressure, the local name P, okay? Now at this point I have a complete rule. A rule I can control in many ways, including I can scan it. And I'm going to say scan this every 10 seconds as an example. And let me resume. And just to show what's happening, you see it's scanning over the display, it's catching all four of the dryers and showing the values at the time they exceed the limit. Now you can edit a rule even while it's running. Instead of 50 here, let me change this to be, for example, 100. And now we've changed the rule as it's running. It's triggering, but it's no longer seeing any values over 100 because these are not quite over 100 yet. But now we're approaching 100. And you'll see the next time the rule triggers, which is every 10 seconds, you'll see it pull up just the displays which satisfy the rule. And here it comes and catches D1 and the value, D2 the value. So you can have rules running at the class level, detecting problems, and taking specific actions. This is a simple demonstration of the power of G2, in particular the object-oriented uh, representation, the structured natural language, and the graphics. Thank you very much.